Um, and some of the other issues we looked at, and this is one of the trials we did with, uh, with Lindsay Corby. Um, and we looked at different, different processing techniques. Um, and obviously, we didn't do this in the lab because we wanted to try and sort of replicate what actually happens in, uh, in winery situations. And what we found is that if we look at a cold fermentation at four days, um, and this is actually from the same vineyard to the same batch of fruit, and obviously there is some variation. So what we're looking at here is basically the, the difference between start and, and uh, a dryness towards the end of fermentation. So we're looking at how much percent change is actually within, uh, within those treatments. And so we looked at from a cold fermentation, a relatively cold fermentation, we saw that there was, there was a, a relatively high increase. Um, with a warmer fermentation, we actually got even more guaiacol. Um, and with a cold maceration um, plus a, a four day 28 degree ferment, a hot ferment, we actually found that the guaiacol actually went up quite a lot. Um, so obviously, um, so what does this mean? Um, it's probably not much good for a full body cabernet to be made at uh, you know, cold fermentation and then press it as quick as possible because you're not going to end up with uh, the characters the wine, the wine maker wants. Oops. We also looked at um, whether you know, perhaps an enzyme does accelerate the, the, the release of glycol um, and perhaps we need to do a bit more work on this but again there was probably a slight increase with a, with a, with a maceration enzyme. Um, again it's probably not statistically significant um, so we'd probably need to do a bit more work in this um, in, terms of, in terms of working out um, you know, does an enzyme help or does particular enzymes actually exacerbate it um, and therefore you know, we shouldn't be recommending their use in the smoke tainted, in the smoke -tainted ferment. And the other thing was actually quite interesting, we also looked at some tannins. Depending on what kind of tannin you use, obviously that's, that's actually going to affect um, you know, your release of, of glycol. So perhaps, um, and obviously um, it's, you know, from this trial, it, you know, there still needs a lot more work to be done in terms of determining, you know, can we recommend some kind of tannin, uh, some kind of tannin management strategy. And you know, using a tannin, um, a cabracho based tannin which actually has high condensing capabilities, then you know, it, there's a possibility that it could bind up some of the glycol during fermentation. So again, um, you know, what, are the, what are the recommendations that we're saying to winemakers? Um, you know, hand harvesting, um, obviously the longer maceration the more, the more smoke character you're going to get. And what could be quite interesting could be some of these sort of perhaps yeast or tannin combinations um, you know, may be able to offset some of the, you know, some of the, some of the characters. Uh, reverse osmosis is obviously a treatment that's actually been, been around quite a lot. Um, I think it's getting, uh, as a treatment, it's getting better. Um, but I think sometimes winemakers seem to think that, um, um, you know, it's going to remove a smoke tank carefully. I think what we know about the implications of smoke and how it actually gets into the, to the fruit and how it actually develops in the wine, um, you know, um, it's not, uh, reverse osmosis isn't going to be the, um, the, the, the complete answer although it does actually have some, some very, very good um, um, benefits. Um, and also blending as well, because what's happening is that, um, you know, if s some of the wines which were actually blended in, in, uh, in 2003, um, what was happening was that um, the, uh, the smoke character, you know, winemakers were sort of blending wines just to, just to get it below sub-sensory uh, level. What was happening as the wine ages, um, you know, the, the, the smoke, the perceived smoke character was actually becoming more and more obvious. This is not a function of the fact that glycol is actually um, uh, increasing uh, after, after the wine is made. It's more a function of the fact that the primary fruit characters of the wine are actually perhaps dissipating and therefore the smoke character is actually, you know, perhaps coming, becoming more obvious. One of the other interesting um, trends that we looked at, and this really needs to be looked at in the context of, of a macro uh, macro environment. What we, what we did here is that we had a lot of, uh, a lot of samples that were submitted to us from, from the King and Alpine Valleys in, in 2007. And what, I, what we tried to do here was, was we, um, we used all of the data, so there's about 550 points of, uh, of, of analysis here that were done on, from these two regions within a period of about 45 days. And the first sampling was around about the, I think it was around about the 2nd of January. And so the last figures here was probably around about the third week of February or towards the end of February. And what we're seeing here is that um, there were two fire events. There's one December, the, uh, the middle of December, or early to middle of December. And the second event was perhaps around, um, around here, perhaps around uh, Verizon. 
And so what we try to do here, so in terms of the data here, what we've, um, we've used, there's all the data has been included and it's from irrespective of any variety. So there's white and red varieties there uh, from different, different parts of the vineyard, uh, different levels of ripening. And what we're seeing here, what's actually quite interesting is that we're seeing a, a perhaps a, a relatively um, constant evolution of, um, of, uh, of glycol levels and actually in the, in the fruit that was actually analyzed. Um, so we have here on the uh, in the red here we have the four methyl, uh, sorry glycol and in the blue here the four 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 glycol. So obviously they're they're on they're on different scales here. Um, and what we normally find is that the ratio of, of glycol to four methyl glycol is about three point seven to one, and that stays relatively constant even though there's a really broad range of data here. Um, and what we're seeing here is that. Um, initially, we, we, we believe that okay, once the fire event is gone, there's perhaps no further there's no further implications in, and in, in fact, the, the smoke character will probably drop off. But what we're seeing here is that there's a there's a sort of really constant evolution, and as the fruit is ripening, and obviously, um, um, it's getting closer towards harvest, then then the levels of glycol actually increasing. Now, this increase is perhaps around about fourfold increase, and what we're seeing here is that the fruit was actually analysed here probably at at, at, at really at pea size or pre veraison and here at this side the fruit the fruit here is probably you know it's being picked at, at harvesting so don't forget um, a berry from pea size to to sort of normal sort of ripening size is probably increased fivefold as well so we're seeing a really really huge increase in terms of glycol um, on, a, on a per kilogram or per, uh, or per gram basis is that clear in, in everybody because I think it's just a telling because it really gives a good indication that there, are, there is a reservoir. What, what you can say is that the conclusion is, is that um, there is a reservoir of smoke character there and it's actually feeding through the vine and actually getting into the fruit. 